Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome to this ECP event on New Geopolitics, Soft Power, and International Cultural Relations. I'm Melinda Crane, moderator of the Deutsche Welle talk show To The Point, and it is a great honor on behalf of our hosts and organizers, the Hertie School and the Institut für Auslandsbeziehungen, IFA, to accompany you this evening as moderator. And my apologies for the late start here. We are just incorporating a statement from a guest who unfortunately couldn't join us. And I will share that a little bit later on, but it took a bit of technology to do that. So apologies uh, to all of you. From Russia's ongoing war on Ukraine to the Hamas attack on Israel on October 7th and the Israeli response from China's tensions with the United States to Chinese and Russian outreach to Africa and other parts of the global south, we are seeing a lot of soul searching in recent months in regard to whether the West is losing ground the list of abstainers and no votes on the United Nations General Assembly resolutions condemning the Russian invasion has been parsed to exactly that end, to, for signs that a new non-aligned or multi-aligned group uh, may be on the rise. Russian and Chinese outreach to Africa and the Middle East is scrutinized for evidence that the Western beacon is dimming. In other words, it is a timely moment to examine whether geopolitics call for a new approach to so soft power in general and to external cultural policy in particular. And that is what we're here to do this evening. As many of those in the room know directly from personal and professional experience, External educational and cultural policy has been a key pillar of Germany's foreign outreach since the Cold War began. Germany clearly possesses significant soft power potential at this very critical juncture in history. But to realize that potential to shape external cultural policy going forward in the face of today's geopolitics, it is absolutely crucial to understand both the context in which cultural policy instruments will be deployed and also what other players are doing. To explore both of those issues, researchers working with the Hertie School, IFA's external cultural policy monitor, have conducted a systematic study comparing the soft power strategies and approaches of eight world powers, including liberal democracies, autocracies, and India, which increasingly is looking a bit like a hybrid of the two, have such strategies and activities changed over time in response to shifts in the economic, political, and security environment? And if so, are there lessons to be learned that have relevance for Germany's cultural, for foreign cultural policy? We'll hear more about the researchers' answers to those questions in just a moment. Allow me a very quick word on our agenda before we begin. We will shortly hear welcome remarks on behalf of our hosts and organizers. Senior Professor Helmut Anheyer will then present the study. And following that, our outstanding panel will explore the researchers' findings and their implications for Germany's external cultural policy. We're also very eager to hear from you, ladies and gentlemen. We welcome your questions during the panel later on, and uh, you will have an opportunity to engage with our speakers at that time. And now, it is my very great pleasure to hand over to Peter Kettner, who is head of the Strategy and Planning Division for Foreign Cultural Policy at the Federal Foreign Office. His 21-year career in the Foreign Service has included postings in Almaty, and Ankara in the Department for Culture and Society. I heard laughter there. Is there an error? Or was that just praise? <laughs> the floor is yours. Welcome. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Good evening. Um, I'm not going to present the study. Um, I, what I'm trying to do is, in a few minutes, and, and very briefly, to make clear why, from our view, um, cultural diplomacy and also science diplomacy, and with that, strategic communications, um, is playing a more and more important role within the foreign, uh, foreign policy landscape in Germany. I think it's not only for Germany, but, but that goes for, for a number of, uh, probably for all countries worldwide. Um, and what we see in other countries is, um, if we, for instance, look on, on China's cultural diplomacy approaches, um, that they extend to a degree that my personal take would be that soft power might not even be the, the right word for that. Um, so it goes more and more into what we used to call hard power. Um, and by that, um, that is what we try to do to make clear within the ministry um, time and time again um, that this is an integral part of foreign policy um, and, and it is integrated in, in, in all the areas um, that, we're, that we're actually trying to, to reach out uh, with our foreign policy approaches. Just a few remarks on, on, on what has been said, but, but also on, on what might be an issue for the panel as well. Um, yes, we're faced with a number of problems. Yes, we're faced with a number of foreign policy, or, or let's say, um, with a number of, of um, challenges that, um, that are challenges not only for foreign policy as a whole, but especially for cultural diplomacy. Um, we have we've heard about um, um, what, or if, if we look to the to to the uh, to the near to the near and Middle East, um, if we look to to the Ukraine, where the um, um, the breach of uh, international law, where the um, where the, the, the war from Russia towards Ukraine is still going on, that changes the, the foreign policy landscape or the landscape of Europe as a, as a whole. And it makes clear that the challenges for, for uh, cultural, diplomacy are, cultural diplomacy are even um, bigger than they have been before. Um, what we also see is when we try to, to find partners worldwide for our approaches, for our ideas, be it in the in the area of climate change issues, be it um, also when it comes to feminist foreign policy, um, but to a number of international policy issues. Um, it is not that easy um, to, to reach out to partners only by government approaches, by government to government approaches, um, but we need to go beyond that point. We need to reach out to, to the societies. We need to, to reach out to people and within our um, cultural diplomacy toolbox, we have all the instruments to do that. We have all the instruments, for instance, to come uh, or to, to move beyond um, a climate uh, foreign policy that, that only goes from, from COP to COP, um, but to, to reach out to the people. So to make a, if you want to say so, um, climate foreign policy of, 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 of societies, of people. Um, and that is, from my point of view, getting more and more important. Um, so it is, I, I think it, it has never been um, as important as it is today um, to make the cultural diplomacy approaches, also the science diplomacy approaches, an integral part of our foreign policy um, yeah, ideas as a whole. Um, and that also means that there are challenges for the for the players that um, that are working in the field of, of cultural diplomacy. Um, I mean, as you said, my career is more than twenty years already. Um, for me, it's the third time that I'm in the Department for Culture and uh, and Society. And I remember that when I came there the first time, we we wouldn't even dare to talk about. Um, the fact that we might reach certain objectives by rolling out cultural diplomacy. Today we, we have reached a point where it is absolutely clear that we spend roughly one billion 
hero taxpayers' money in order to, to do that cultural diplomacy. It is absolutely normal to expect that some results might, out, might come out of this. Um, and that these results um, certainly will play in the greater context of foreign policy. Um, but still, um, there is, from my point of view, um, not enough understanding on both sides, um, be it on the, on the side of the players of cultural diplomacy, that they are part of a of, of foreign policy system and that they and, and, and by that uh, and that that also means that they um, that the foreign policy goals that we have are are being reached by the tools that we have and that these tools are culture um, of course science um, and on the other hand that what actually we are doing um, in, in the field of cultural diplomacy um, is a part of hard, if you want to say so, hard power foreign policy. Um, that, for instance, uh, a security power approach that goes um, or that, that tries to reach a goal of security and stability without get, uh, taking into account what is going on in societies and without taking into account the cultural um, circumstances of, of the respective societies um, might not be an, an approach that, that is very long lasting because we have to reach out to, to those societies. And I think that is uh, a point where we still have to, to work a lot on um, to, have, uh, to foster the mutual under understanding on both sides. And I think this is why it is really, really good and important to have reports like that, uh, because we can learn from other countries. We have to learn from other countries. Um, this is also something that is very important uh, when it comes to our feminist foreign policy approach, um, where, we, where we say on a regular basis, we're here to listen, we're here to learn. Um, this, this goes for cultural diplomacy as a whole, um, and that is why um, we need more studies like this in order to, to learn from others, because um, the assumption is that others do it better. I mean, I think we, we, we're trying to do some, or we, we're trying to do it well, but, um, but it's obvious that in some areas, others do it, uh, are doing better than we do. And um, um, yeah, that's why I'm really looking forward to the presentation and um, to getting to know what we can learn from the study. Thank you very much for having me to, tonight and um, all the best for the discussion and thank you very much. <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Peter Kettner, for those remarks and I'd be very curious to know which others are doing it better. Uh, perhaps you can share that later on when we get to the, the discussion. <laughs> Let me, before we uh, go on, just say a quick word about the IFA Herdi School initiative that produced the study that we're about to hear about. It was developed by Herdi's senior professor and of sociology and past president, Helmut Anheyer, who will also now present it. The external cultural policy monitor was launched in 2022 in the spring for the purpose of analyzing cultural policy strategies and initiatives across Europe. And Professor Anheyer emphasized at that time that the crucial, that there was a very crucial importance to evidence-based policy making at a time when we are seeing shifting geopolitical tensions and turbulence on the rise. And let's hear more now on what the latest study tells us about that. Professor Anheyer, the floor is yours. Yeah, um, thank you, Melinda, for, for your kind words. But can we have an agreement to just drop the senior? Can, can you do that? <laughs> you want junior? <laughs> uh, I wouldn't mind. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, thank you so much um, for, for, your, uh, for being here. And uh, we worked hard the last few months in uh, finishing the study. And I, I should also uh, uh, recognize at, at the very beginning uh, uh, Ted Knudsen, who's in the audience. Well, there you are, Ted. Uh, he's been a terrific uh, co-author. And Regina List, unfortunately, uh, um, suffers from COVID and can't be here tonight. 
but it's been a, it, it's been a great team, I, I must say. So um, what we have is a product of the uh, external cultural monitor, and you see on this map the countries we have uh, covered uh, so far. It's an ongoing project, and I welcome you uh, to visit the website. And once a year, we focus on a particular issue or topic, and this year, of, as you can see, it is about the changing geopolitics, and we ask a number of uh, key questions. Um, how does Germany's external cultural policy compare to others? Right? We just heard from Mr. Kettner that he thinks uh, other countries are doing some bits better, and uh, what would that be? And have recent shifts in geopolitics changed the role of power plays in international affairs, and what does that mean for external cultural policy, and what policy recommendations can we arrive at? Now, uh, a boring part in the presentation is, is needed uh, to make clear what we are talking about. Uh, soft power is really a, the attraction a country has in the eyes of others, right? and that helps to get other countries to do things that you want. Right? And that uh, typically includes state-led or state-supported initiatives, and the idea is to use external cultural policy to increase soft power. Right? And part of that is a narrative that countries have for themselves. Right? It's a sense-making uh, device, also a legitimating device, and uh, it is a positive portrait or a series of reflections how we would like others to see this country and how we uh, would like to be uh, seen as well. Now that contrasts, of course, with hard power, and we all know what that, that is, right? And there is also coercive economic power, and that largely means sanctions, right? And in the report, we put soft power in the context of the others, and what we really would like Germany to have more is smart power, Right? And this is the kind of the, the smart combination of the other powers. And I, and I think uh, that picture of Ronald Reagan, uh, in a way, tells it all of what is meant by, by smart power. Right? He was ridiculed at that time by many, but um, he was actually proven right. So what did we cover? Uh, ECP covers many, many different fields. We focused on language education, on arts and culture, media, social media, primary and secondary education, and higher education and science diplomacy. We did not look at sport diplomacy, international relations, uh, uh, business relations, or uh, private sector-led initiatives. But important in this country, uh, one should add, uh, are the activities of uh, private foundations. Right? And they also carry out external cultural activities that may or may not coincide with the preferences of the government in power. Right? Uh, which, of course, is different for the autocracies that we looked at. Um, so we compare democracies, four partners, with um, four, uh, three autocracies and two battled uh, democracies. And we're interested in what is their narrative and what are their activities and strategies compared to what we see in Germany. Um, I hope you can read this. This is just a rough ranking of... Um, uh, different uh, power dimensions, uh, the, and you see that, that Germany is really uh, right up there when it comes to uh, a trade ranking, uh, also when it comes to sanctions, because the EU has a uh, uh, significant sanctions regime. Uh, in soft power, it tends to be between two and four, and you see the drop in hard power that happened in the last uh, couple of years from 0.8 to 0.15. This is not because Germany significantly spent less. Uh, in fact, other countries spent more. So it, because it's a ranking, it's not uh, absolute numbers. Right? Um, so if we take a closer look at, uh, at Germany, uh, we find in arts and culture that it, is, uh, it has one of the largest networks worldwide. And the Goethe Institute alone organizes 20,000 events a year attracting uh, a large number of visitors. Right? Uh, in language education, uh, German, German ranks fourth in the number of language learners worldwide. The number has increased in recent years, 
and there were just under 800,000 exams conducted in 2022, again by the Goethe Institute. And then there is the rather successful PASH network, uh, 2,000 schools in 120 countries, and, um, and the PASH network, of course, is important when it comes to attracting talent uh, to this country. Right? And, and higher education and science, uh, there are just under 3 million uh, foreign students in, in Germany in this country, makes it one of the largest destinations after the United States. Right? Uh, science diplomacy is, in fact, one of the most developed parts of German ECP. The DAD uh, dishes out 140,000 stipends of various forms and kinds to academics. Right? And the uh, Alexander von Hubert Foundation has t uh, over 2,000 research partnerships. Uh, Deutsche Welle um, is one of the larger media institutions of its kind worldwide and has an audience of, 100 and, uh, of 127 million in, uh, in 2022. Now, what does that all cost? It's about, um, uh, where is it? It's about uh, government support is 2.3 billion if it added all up, right? Uh, is that a lot of money? Some would say yes. You said yes, it's a lot of money. I would say it's not a lot of money. Because that's the budget of um, a medium-sized university, right? So is that a lot of money for a country of 85 million? Uh, you can, we can debate that, right? But it's, uh, um, uh, it's something that uh, we should really reflect on uh, how much is it is reasonable to spend on what we have in mind. Later on, we tell you what we see as the priorities. So what are the signature characteristics? A very, very strong emphasis, strong emphasis throughout um, on the pre-political space, right? So for dialogue, understanding, and trust building. That's been there uh, for decades, right? And increasingly in recent, uh, can you say the last 15 years or so, and particularly with the, uh, the current administration, a determination to advocate for liberal values, fundamental rights, and now the, uh, the um, uh, feminist foreign policy. It is one of the few countries with a strong presence in all major ECP fields. Right? It is relatively well funded, and it has a decentralized, a decentralized institutional structure because we have these prominent arm's length institutions like Goethe, DAD, and so on. But it has for a long time had a significant, uh, an ambivalent relationship with the concept of soft power and power. In, in general, there was a certain hesitation, which you, of course, can explain by looking at, at uh, German history. How does that compare to the other countries? And I could tell you, um, uh, I could spend 15, 20 minutes on each of the countries, but I won't do that. I'll just give you the main, main thrust of how the other countries compare. In France, there is this emphasis on la francophonie, right? The, that's not only the French-speaking countries, but also the uh, you could say the colonial history of that country. Uh, the United Kingdom in recent years has shifted quite to nation branding and using soft power approaches as a way uh, to, uh, to, to gain commerce and trade, right? particularly after, after Brexit. Uh, and the United States doesn't really have a coherent uh, soft power policy in a way you could argue it doesn't need it because it has Hollywood, it has the other appeal of American mass culture. And it is, as you saw in the rankings, the number one soft power country in the world. Now looking at the autocracies, we see that uh, Russia for a number of years has now used uh, various ways and means uh, to uh, infiltrate the near, what they call the near abroad, in the ex-Soviet space. And they, they do that by trying to undermine Western hegemony, disrupt political systems, and try to create division, right? Uh, we have numerous examples, and we have to be careful what we say because the Russia house is right next door, right? And I'm sure they're listening in, in what we're doing here tonight. Uh, China has, um, in uh, recent years uh, expanded the Confucius Institutes, but there's a bit of a backlash against them. Critical in, in the way uh, soft power activities happen in China is the link to the Belt and Road Initiative. Right? So the, the link is less to hard power, what we did in case in with uh, Russia, but more to 
uh, shark bar. And then uh, Saudi Arabia, in a way, it's just starting. It uh, has operated primarily, primarily in the Muslim world, building mosques. Uh, but it's now trying to uh, project a modernized image of itself uh, using soft power activities. And then we have Turkey. Turkey and India are also a bit of startups in, uh, in the field. Uh, Turkey largely uh, uh, reaching out to uh, diasporas, uh, to Tur Turkish minorities in, in Germany, for example. But most of it is around the, the Turkic-speaking uh, communities uh, around Turkey and, and the Middle East. Uh, and then we have India. India has vast uh, uh, diaspora communities around the world, and it's now trying to get an image across that uh, India is somehow a soft and kind power, irrespective of the fact that it is a formidable military power and is in, uh, ensnared in regional conflicts uh, as well. So, so Germany in comparative perspective, so unlike France, this country, you might say, is not beholden to colonial past. Right? In a way, it's, it's freer to choose where its strategic interests lie, and it is not trying to uh, counteract um, uh, American cultural hegemony. Right? It's much more open in that regard. And unlike uh, the UK, it is really not pushing very much for nation branding and linking ECP to commercial ends. And unlike um, the US, Germany does need a coherent external culture policy because there's no German Hollywood or no uh, American dream um, that uh, would always speak for itself and, and carry uh, its diplomatic weight. And we are totally different from the uh, other countries that I looked at. Uh, so what are the, the current geopolitics? Um, these were the principles of German policy prior to February 22, right? Ever deeper European Union um, uh, engagement, reliable transatlantic relations, uh, especially in defense, so relying on the United States, restraint in all military matters, and belief in the soothing power of commerce, and then and that's where soft power comes in a lot, international dialogue, open pre-political spaces, promoting democracy and, and human rights. And then we had a Russian invasion, and we had a famous speech by the chancellor, and where he announced that there will be serious um, consequences and that we have to have a strategic rethink. Now, how much of that has happened? We all know that um, the procurement and rearmament of the uh, Bundeswehr is very slow, uh, German industry really relies, uh, still relies heavily on China. And we are facing a budget crisis that we don't know how much it will filter down to various ministries. And importantly, and um, still to my disbelief, there was a decision against establishing a National Security Council. Right. And we uh, conducted last year a foresight project where we uh, tried to identify what is or envision what is the world going to look like in 2030, right? And we had two drivers that we, we thought were absolutely essential in shaping the future of the world. One was the di distribution of economic growth, right? The scale of this, uh, the growth and how it is uh, even across different regions of the globe, and the level of geopolitics. And we came up with uh, four scenarios. And we thought, based on expert interviews and validation, that most likely is that we will move into a Cold War 2.0, but not in a pure form. It's going to be a hybrid. And the hybrid, unfortunately, is acrimonious uh, globalization. Right? So we will have uh, tensions increasing with the, between US and China right? with rivalry. But it doesn't mean that they will cut ties. There will still be exchange, but the exchanges will be reduced. And uh, supply chains, for example, will reorient themselves within these blocks. Right? And there will be a slightly uneven economic growth as part of that. And then we have Arist um, 
autocracies, very opportunistic autocracies that will try to exploit domestic weaknesses, uh, as we see uh, in the case of, of Russia. So the implications are we will have a block formation. Right? Uh, uh, there will be a new block emerging next to the West that leads to higher military spending. There will be fierce economic competition to make sure that countries that are not aligned join the Western alliance or a Chinese-led alliance. The number of opportunistic autocracies is likely to increase. Iran is another example. And for ECP, we assume that there will be intense competition across all. And there are just examples here. Science diplomacy will be key in terms of innovation and scientific progress, but also to attract foreign talent. Right? Uh, in the media, I think we will see more of these propaganda wars. They can be quite subtle. And with AI on the horizon to, to do more of that, it will become more complex. And there will be a mobilization of diaspora uh, communities and the building of echo chambers, as we uh, saw uh, just in recent weeks again. So the implications are um, what used to be a relatively independent, and Mr. Kettner, correct me if I'm wrong, a, a relatively independent policies, a set of policies in the Foreign Office will become much more integrated into defense and trade policies in particular. And the normative foundation that we all cherish and value in that world will become, in, will become challenged. And there will be difficult compromises uh, uh, to be reached. And there will be more frequent strains between what the Foreign Office or what the Defense Ministry or the Economics Ministry wants and what the arms length institutions have in mind. So, and internationally, it means that we have to use ECP very strategically to forge new alliances right, while maintaining the old ones. And do not let the channels of communication with rivals close. So it's important to still talk to the autocratic countries, whether it's China or Iran. Domestically, it means that we have to uh, realize that external cultural policy has also a domestic element to it, right? And we have to be aware that outside interests are pushing agendas inside this country that we may not welcome. And we, again, we have seen that in recent weeks, right? So our recommendations, um, so because we have a lot to say about recommendations here. Uh, we think there should be a strategic review um, there is somewhat of an, a strategic void that is still there after uh, Chancellor Scholz proclaimed you know, the Zeiten vendor, and we haven't really thought that through till the very end, and what that means for external culture policy. And we make a very, very strong plea for adequate financial basis of a successful uh, external culture policy. It is a cheap way of winning and maintaining friends. Right? Compare that to military hardware, right? this is a good deal. And I think we have to get that message across much, much more. We have to embrace the idea that ultimately this is about power. Right? This is not only about being liked by others. We, there is a purpose behind wanting to be liked. And that is influence or power. And we have to be very clear about that and also see that aspect of power in the context of the other sources of power we discuss. And then uh, we think that external culture policy that Germany has conducted in the last decades has been actually quite successful. Right? If you compare where this country was in the 1950s and 60s and where it is now. So it is doing something right. And I think what it is doing right, it should do more, but it should do it by building on existing strengths and do it in a more strategic way. So our Four recommendations are fill in the strategic void in and around ECP, do more what has traditionally worked, 
link, and that's new, link domestic and international aspects, and don't rely on past assumptions. Right? So can this country learn to use smart power effectively? That was one of the questions we had. Yes, we think it can, and maybe it should, but it has to be more strategic. Right? There has to be a presence inside the government where ECB carries a strong voice. Right? It is our impression that it could have a stronger voice. But correct us, Mr. Kettner, if, if we're wrong here. Um, and we also think, uh, and that goes a bit beyond the study uh, we did comparing Germany to others, uh, the coordination among the ministries could be much improved, and I think also the coordination, uh, the cooperation among the intermediaries that um, uh, we have, and what is already happening with EU partners and at the EU level uh, generally. So there's, um, there's much to do, and we uh, look forward to the discussion later on, and uh, we thank you for listening. Thank you. Microphone, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Helmut. And you can actually stay right here because you're joining our panel. So come back, please. Um, and why don't you take that seat right there? And I will ask the other panelists to please also join me now on stage, and then I'll introduce you when you are here. So um, I, my hands are very full, therefore I can't read from my script. I'll just ask um, Ms. Schroes if you will please take this seat right here. And uh, Ms. Tefasius, if you will take the seat next to her. Actually, let's do this another way. Let's have you next to Professor Anhaya. And just get, you know, the ladies in the middle. And um, Ms. Tefasius, if you'll take this seat. And Professor Beg, where are you? So if you'll take that one right there, please. And now you get your proper introductions, excuse me, but um, carrying a lot of devices here. So, oops. It is a great pleasure to welcome our panel, and I will begin uh, with our, our co-host of the evening, when I find her here, Gita Tsosh. I hope I'm more or less pronouncing the last name. <laughs> Tsoch. <laughs> there we go. Gita Tsoch is Secretary General of the Institute for Auslandsbeziehungen IFA, the co uh, organizer of the study, and she previously served as director of the European Union National Institute for Culture, UNIC, and also worked with the Goethe Institute. Welcome. It's uh, a great honor to, uh, to have you here on the panel. We were supposed to have been joined today by the Member of Parliament, Michelle Mutefering. Unfortunately, she could not join us. She has sent us a statement that I will share uh, in a little bit, uh, but we are very pleased uh, that we could win the participation at very short notice of her Bundestag colleague, Awet Tefesius, who is a member of the Bundestag from the Green Party from the state of Hesse. She was born in Eritrea, came to Germany Germany at the age of 10 as a refugee and later represented refugees and asylum seekers before the German courts as a lawyer before she became the first black woman to be elected to the Bundestag. It's very, very kind of you to join us at such very short notice. And I'm very glad to welcome uh, Professor Ian Beck. He is professional research fellow at the professorial research fellow at the London School of Economics and uh, at the European Institute. He has led and participated in numerous research projects on various aspects of EU policy and was rapporteur for the high-level group that carried out the interim evaluation of the EU Seventh Framework Program for research, among others. Oh, really? Okay. Well, it's still on your LSE biography. <laughs> so a very warm welcome to you. Thank you so much for making the trip from London. And before we dive deeper now on the report itself, I would like to ask all of you to comment on the basic premise of the report, which is that German external cultural policy, ECP, should in fact respond to shifting geopolitical circumstances. And uh, simply tell us, if you would, whether you agree with that assumption and why. 
Why is that important? Um, and I'll just go straight down the panel, if I may, beginning with um, Gita Tsos. Sure. Um, yeah, that's a big question, and I think the answer uh, is also not very difficult to give, uh, because I do think that uh, these geopolitical shifts that we're seeing are challenging our work, um, and that this calls for maybe not necessarily um, completely rethinking what we're doing, because I think, you know, IFA has a history of over 100 years, and there's always been this idea of Völkerverständigung, so it's bringing people together um, at the core of, of our beliefs, even though that has shifted a lot during those years. But bringing people together is still our core belief, you know, and we do it through culture, and we do it through the instruments that, that, that we have. But now, with, with things shifting in the world, looking again, are we still using the right instruments? Are we focusing on the, on the right regions of the world? Um, um, are we addressing the right target groups? Are we doing it in the right way? Do we have the credibility also with our partners abroad, with the people that we work with? That, that needs to be uh, looked at, and this is what we're, what we're also doing. So we're preparing a process right now where we, where we look at um, yeah, what is our purpose in today's world, and, uh, and do we need to readjust uh, what we're doing? And so, yeah. Given the shift in geopolitics that we're talking about, are there particular areas where you would say we're facing quite a dramatic challenge in this area and we really need to up our game, uh, increase uh, you know, certain kinds of ECP? Yeah, I mean, um, we have a way of looking at conflicts in the world that tries not to oversee any of the conflicts because um, a lot of our programs were developed uh, to um, mitigate conflict, for instance. We have a um, cross-culture program, for instance, which supports young people who engage uh, for human rights, for, for uh, climate change in countries where it's particularly hard. Um, and so, but we have recently seen two conflicts that um, have challenged our work in a, in a way that is new, and one is the attack of Hamas on Israel, and the other one is the attack of Russia on Ukraine. And, uh, and especially the first one has shifted how our partners in the uh, Arab-speaking world are looking at what we're doing and are looking at what Germany is doing abroad. And so this is changing our daily interactions with, um, with the people that we work with. So yeah, it, that's a big topic, but it is actually um, influencing our work on a daily basis. Thank you very much, and we'll, we'll return to that point a little bit later on. But let me ask uh, Awet uh, Tefesius the same question, basically, whether you would agree with the premise that we need to re-examine uh, how we approach ECP in light of shifting geopolitical circumstances, and also where you see particularly important areas or important challenges. I totally agree with uh, Gitte. I think um, when, when things change, and I think Things change naturally always, but now in a dramatic way. I think we have to have a new look at things. What do we need to change? How are we working? And uh, like you said, how do we keep on the communication with the Arab world? I think it's very, very important. And at the moment, the communication is uh, very hard, really. And, and I believe that the higher the crises are, the more we have to talk, the more we have we need cultural diplomacy and this communication and culture. So we have to intensify it in these days because as we heard uh, from Professor Anheim before, uh, diplomacy alone won't work. And on the other hand, we have uh, the topic about um, uh, information propaganda and false information, which is not only influ influencing other countries, but also us in Germany because it is during the, uh, uh, through the um, communities from other countries and the diaspora, it always has also an impact on us. Also, the, the attack of Hamas on Israel has also an impact here in Germany. So things are changing. So these are new aspects we ha which we have to look on. 
And certainly both Helmut and Peter Kettner talked about that interaction between the domestic and the external as being uh, increasingly important in the current setting. Professor Beck. First, let me say what a pleasure it is not to be talking about Brexit or Euro crisis. <laughs> um, I've worked with Helmut on, on, this, on these notions previously, and so I know something of the background to this. I think my first response to your, your question is we, we're in a context where hard power has seen a resurgence. Hard power has always been there in the background, but what we're seeing now is very evident resort to hard power as the first stage of trying to influence other parts of the world. Alongside, and as Helmut has changed his terminology slightly now refers to sharp, to smart power rather than sharp power, but I think sharp power is about using your elbows to get your way, coercing others, and that's, that's also seeing a resurgence. I do wonder though, whether there is enough relevance in, here I'm going to be, I'm going to stop praising the report and start, start picking at bits of it and say, is there enough relevance in the sense of, is anybody listening? Because if, if nobody is listening, mm -hmm. let alone being impressed by what you're doing, then ECP has a major mountain to climb to be effective. So that, that would be my, my first sort of category of answers. Maybe one last addition to this is, we see this across Europe, it's not just Germany, that Europe's influence in, in global matters is receding. It seems to be in decline. And if, if, if Europe loses traction, Germany within Europe also loses traction. And that's where, the, to me, the big risks arise. Thank you. I want to pick up on the is anybody listening point when we talk about whether the aims that Helmut presented at the end of his, uh, of his presentation, namely the idea that communication needs to be maintained with rivals, whether those aims are actually feasible. Um, in practice, but let me ask you, uh, if I may, in terms of your own work, are you seeing changes in the way that other leading powers, and particularly non-democratic powers, approach ECP? I'm not gonna say it's in the work I do, is, but um, one recent example maybe makes the case, which is I, I was invited by one of the entities covered in the report, China Global Television Network, to come along to an event <coughs> in the, the Mint, which is a historic building opposite the Tower of London, at which they were presenting Chinese culture and making the case that Chinese culture is 5,000 years old and nobody has older culture than that. Well, that maybe is a, a dubious statistic, but nevertheless, this was a huge effort going on from China to drag people in to say, think of our culture, be aware of it. So there's clearly an effort going on elsewhere. But I, th I think another way of conceptualizing this is that Soft power is, is first and foremost seen to be about values. You, you want others to understand your values. But there's a risk, and I think this comes out in some of the report, of it, be, of it being confused with propaganda. And you talk about in the report uh, RT and Sputnik as instruments of Russian soft power. Are they? I'd say they're more propaganda. Yeah, um, I think that... Just wave over to the technical people. Hi, tech. Yeah, it's working now. Yeah, um, I want to uh, get back to the audience uh, who's listening. Of course, Putin is not listening, right? But there are enough um, people around the world who who are listening. There is a there is a demand, I think, for ECP, and there's probably much more of a demand than we realize, right? Uh, when you look at uh, arts and cultural exchanges, if you, uh, m many artists around the world would love to spend a month or two here. Right? But we, we, we have limited capacity. So artist communities around the world are listening. Um, look at the number of students um, uh, studying in this country that have, um, I think, increased significantly in the last decade. So um, there, there is a demand. And unlike uh, other forms of power, soft power is kind of a drip, 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 but it's slow, it's slow moving. And you need to be added over a long period of time. And more countries are realizing this. Um, what, uh, what Ted and I found out is that, uh, was it less than, uh, than two decades ago, very few countries around the world had anything resembling a soft power policy. And now many do, and even more are thinking about it. So, uh, but it also means that there's more competition. 
right? So we're not the only ones. And why I think, why, why I make it strongly to be more strategic is to be aware that others are out there sounding different messages. And if I can get one example, um, as um, about three or four years ago, uh, was before COVID, uh, I, I was in Egypt and interviewed a former, uh, the former foreign minister of Egypt. Uh, and the purpose of the interview was to get a sense of how he sees uh, German activity in soft power related matters compared to Russia, China, and the US. And he said, well, he said, you Germans, you, uh, when, you know, when Sisi was uh, getting more autocratic, the first thing you talked about, uh, let's create safe spaces, right, for artists. And then you had the, the Chinese ambassador come and uh, uh, talk to the foreign minister and to Modi, said, we are both representatives of ancient civilizations, you see? And that is a very, very different pitch, a very different narrative. And it's that kind of narrative that we have to counter. And that's where I see the strategic void, that we, we may not yet be there. Let me pick up on that in just a moment, but I do want to give Michelle Mutefering uh, a chance to say a word or two indirectly via me, because I have the text of the message that she sent to uh, the Institute for Auslandsbeziehungen, and if I just sort of freely translate what she says in regard to the question I posed earlier, do we need a different uh, external cultural policy, or do we need to take another look at ECP in the face of, of geopolitical shifts. She says she absolutely believes we do, that uh, at the latest since um, the chancellor presented his Zeitenwende, uh, the notion that Germany uh, needs to reorient its security uh, policy um, and, and strategy, that we do also need a parallel change in external cultural policy, and she also, emphasized that she feels that much has been achieved uh, in recent uh, years uh, in terms of the work that the Bundestag is doing in this area, and certainly I think uh, probably Awet uh, will speak to a few of these points as well. But she says, for example, we have expanded um, Schutzprogramme, protection uh, programs also uh, within the, the uh, framework of the EU um, uh, Council Presidency uh, made proposals for better European coordination also in regard to development cooperation between the EU and Africa that has cultural components as well, uh, German-French uh, cooperation, and programs to rescue cultural, um, cultural goods, uh, cultural artifacts uh, through the THW and also through the German Archaeological Institute in order to uh, try to respond more quickly to the destruction of uh, important uh, cultural uh, works uh, and all of that under the program Culture and Crisis. So with that, with that, she is outlining some of what she feels works well in German ECP. And I'd like to ask all of you as well, because part of the study is that you say we need to do more of what works. <coughs> And, and the study talks about some of the strengths that you see in German cultural, uh, external cultural policy. Let me ask all of you to comment on what you think works well uh, and where you see particular strengths uh, on Germany's part. And uh, whoever wants to go first, perhaps Gita? Sure, um, because Michelle also mentioned the at-risk programs that um, are programs that were, we a really a new addition to our traditional profile of cultural relations and you know Helmut you were saying in your um, in your presentation that this connection between external uh, cultural policy and domestic policy is new or sort of I mean it depends on what you mean by new but this sort of connection between in and and out and I think we've been talking about this for for years now and I think the at-risk programs are one um, particular instrument where this manifests because we offer spaces, rest and respite programs for artists, cultural workers, but also human right defend, rights defenders <coughs> who cannot work anymore freely in their home countries. And so these programs were developed to allow them to, um, either in Germany or in a neighboring country, um, to, to, yeah, to rest and, and to to work also, to continue to work. And they, these programs were developed 
for a number of, of people each year and we now see that the demand is much higher, so who's listening? Yes, I think uh, a lot of people are listening, a lot of people do want to get in touch with us. And so this is a program that is taking place in Germany, even though it's traditional cultural relations. And I think in, uh, we see this in several of our programs, for example, the platform Contemporary Ant, which uh, connects artistic uh, views um, of the African diaspora, of artists in Africa and Latin America. And so you cannot really um, pull apart this, this is outside and this is inside. And, um, and I think for all the challenges that you pointed out, these are, these are um, possible alleyways that we could take, that we could in intensify to, to counter these challenges. Thank you very much. And um, I would, if I could also ask you to talk a little bit about where you see Germany's strengths and also potential strengths, because two points that Helmut made interested me in regard to an area that I know you have concentrated on in your work, namely the idea of returning stolen cultural works. And um, Helmut talked about Germany not being beholden to a colonial past. Would you entirely agree with that point of view, and um, what is gained by returning those works in terms of Germany's, of how others see Germany, and how that again ties into Germany's larger foreign policy aims? Yeah, he's right in the sense of not as much as uh, France, definitely not, or UK, definitely not. But we do have our colonies, we, we do have our legacy, we do have our responsibility. And uh, as Gitte was saying, you can't just separate internal and external. It always have reflects on each other. So if we want good relations with countries like um, Namibia, Tanzania, we also have to reflect on the colonial past. But on the other hand, reflecting on the colonial past and what happened in Namibia has also affects how we live in Germany with, for instance, with the black community here. And when you was, were talking about the programs for artists, we have also programs for journalists, journalists in exile, for instance. And these are people working here because they couldn't work in their countries. But their reports, their works has effects in the Ukraine, in Russia, and also in the communities here. So I, I do believe we've talked about it also get a, a, a such long time. And I do believe we have to stop thinking between internal and external because the world has changed and these effects do affect each other. And so bringing back the goods to Namibia, to Benin, to Nigeria, for instance, um, opens the door to these countries, but also opens the door to our communities living here, which is also very important. Thank you very much. And Ian, a view from outside, if you would, when you look at Germany, where would you say Germany's narrative is? What would you say could be strengths, either potential or current, of Germany's ECP? Well, this turns part to a question I posed at this uh, Chinese event I mentioned. I said, well, what about the Greco-Roman tradition and, and all of that, to which Germany is undoubtedly a major contributor in, in many fields of the arts? I think that has to be valued in the way Germany approaches things. I, I'd like to pick up on also in this regard on a point Helmut made earlier, which is the drip drip process, to assert that it's really a long game. And the, the long game is one in which you don't expect to be able to tweak the policy in response to Russia invading Ukraine or whatever is happening next in, in uh, Israel, Gaza, because is, this is something that c accumulates over time. And you can't expect to say, let's change our foreign policy tomorrow because of this, and in, the, in that change, think of a different way of, of doing ECP. There are reasons to change ECP, undoubtedly, which might be the sort of things that uh, has, already been uh, has already been mentioning to us, but they're different from responding to the, the current state of, of global crisis. And if, if I just maybe add one other thing, that in the report, I found it very convincing in many respects, but sometimes just a tad too much focused on process. And in, in some cases as well, the, the assessment that I'm reading in the report comes over as two-edged. This is good, but it's also bad at the same time. 
Uh, I think some clarity on, on these sorts of things would be helpful. I would like to um, come back to the p opening pre-political space in dialogue as a potential strength of um, German uh, ECP and perhaps link it to something that Peter Kettner said in his remarks about the fact that we need to see soft power as um, the aims of soft power as part of the overall aims of foreign policy and, and essentially establish policy coherence. Uh, that was more or less what I understood you to be saying there. Um, that would mean also, how do we evaluate the effectiveness of ECP in terms of foreign policy aims? And I raise this for a particular reason. I had the great privilege to be involved in a number of initiatives on the part of Goethe Institute and Deutsche Welle together that sought to open pre-political uh, pre spaces for dialogue. They involved intercultural mediation in places ranging from uh, Bishkek, uh, Kyrgyzstan to, um, to Syria in 2010. And we thought that we were doing some very valuable work with journalists and other members uh, of, of Syrian society, for example, who were trying to find a way to discuss very sensitive topics in a very inflammatory setting. And all of us found ourselves questioning whether anything we had done had been effective in light of what happened later. And I think this is the long game that Ian is talking about in a way. Um, but how would you evaluate those efforts in the face of geopolitics that can lead to shutting down all such spaces? Anybody? Well, there's any consolation. I had a, a point of my own, which is what does pre-political spaces mean? I'd like some insight into that from uh, one, maybe one of the authors. Maybe you know what it is, but I'm not sure. That said... Spaces that... Um, don't cross red lines that mean um, in authoritarian societies automatic uh, repression and or even uh, jailing. So looking for ways to discuss very, very difficult topics in an inflammatory environment. Okay. Right. And now the bad news. I, I've been working and st still working now on a, a project for the European Parliament on what's called performance budgeting. Now, performance budgeting is an intriguing concept, which is just about mentioned in the report. And then I think you, you say, right, this is, this is nothing new. It's, all, it's just the, the Thatcherite approach to managing the, the public sector. But I think there's a, you're too dismissive of this, because what, what the, the new thinking on performance budgeting tells us is that you should be looking not just for feedback on does it work, but feedback on how you relate what you find on does it work or not to future policy development. And that loop, I think, is a very important part of trying to work out how it should evolve in future. The trouble is, with soft power, your metrics are very limited. You don't have the indicators that you might have on road building or training and so on. So I think it might be a useful addition to the way of thinking about this, to think about whether there are indicators that you can exploit to say this is something we can build on and use for development of the of, of the, the policy. In a way, this is still part of the recommendation in the report, uh, Helmut, uh, to do more of what works. And I guess when I'm asking about how do we evaluate effectiveness, I'm asking that question. How do we, how do we say what works when we are playing a very long game and when we don't always have good metrics for figuring out what influence we had? Well, um, first you need to consider that um, the data situation in ECP is not very good. Right, limited data, but there, there are data, and of course, in, the, in this project and others, uh, you know, people are adding to it. Um, <clears throat> I'll give you one example um, that uh, maybe that's what you mean. So, uh, this country, we all know that, um, needs to import talent, right? Because of the demographic change, right, and the shortage of labor, we need lots of smart people to come here. How do they come here? They come here as students. And we just heard, learned from the uh, statistical office, the Statis, that one third of the students stay, right? 
And of those, a substantial number, I can't remember what, is still in the country after 10 years. Now that, I would say, uh, combined with the growing number of students that we have at German universities, would be an indicator of success or of effectiveness, right? And students are cheap, right? They don't cost a lot of money, right? So you get a... a yeah, that's that sounds really dehumanizing. <laughs> it, I didn't mean it in a dehumanizing way, but uh, um, we're at a school of governance and we talk a lot of eco you know, economics and also cheap, expensive, and so on. <laughs> anyway, uh, but I want to uh, say something else about uh, the colonial past. Um, I, I totally agree with you that uh, th this country should have done much more when it comes to Tanzania, Namibia, and perhaps Togo, and, but also in the Pacific. Uh, but I, I, I disagree with uh, the Benin bronzes, and I've written about it, uh, because uh, you know, Nigeria was a British colony, it, uh, and the Benin bronzes were bought from the Brits a long time ago. And I am of the belief that the reason we uh, sent the bronzes back to Nigeria, because there was no real urgent reason to do that, but correct me if I'm wrong, was to curry favor with the Nigerian government, because it's a very, very important economic, uh, emerging economic power. And here we have a connection between economic interest and soft power activities. Isn't that exactly the smart power you're talking about in your report? Oh, yeah, could be, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think, you know, evidence-based policy and, and, uh, and the monitor is, is part of that is increasing in our field. You know, yes, it's difficult to have indicators and, and evaluate uh, compared to other sectors of society, but we're, we're getting there. And I think there is more prof professionalization. I think us being active in the, in the field, we all know that it has an impact what we're doing. And, uh, you know, I was just reminded um, on Instagram, I think yesterday or so, um, I saw photos of, um, um, I think he's a hip hopper, Bob Ellis is his name, um, and he was invited to, to the human rights conference that the Green Party did at the Bundestag last Monday. And, uh, and I saw that he took photographs of himself in that, in that setting together with um, Luisa Amtsberg. And I wrote to him, I said, congratulations, I had no idea you were in Berlin because we met in Kinshasa in uh, 2016. And he was saying, yes, thank you, Gitte, because you invited me to that talent, I think we did a workshop for, um, for, for young artists, you know, to, to do capacity building, because you invited me there. That brought me uh, to Berlin now, and that has broadened my scope, and that it has deepened my professional um, uh, capacity. Um, and he was, he was connecting that to uh, the activities of a cultural relations organization um, of Germany, uh, Goethe Institute in, in Kinshasa. And these are anecdotes, yeah, but we know many of those. And so, so we do know that, that this work um, actually has an effect. And so also um, coming back to your, the question that you raised about your experience in 2010, and, and of, of things that shut down. Yes, I think we cannot expect from the work we do that it saves the world entirely, but we do know that, what, uh, that we're adding a little part of making, of, of creating these, uh, these spaces of freedom, freedom of expression, of, of, of connecting people, um, and, and of peace in a way. And to come back to the question of cheap and expensive, um, you know, one billion um, is roughly spent on cultural relations and educational policies in Germany. The city of Stuttgart uh, is currently raising one billion euros to renovate the opera building, you know, and you also put this, this um, amount of money into question. And I just, I think this is, it's good that we, you know, that uh, you also say that, uh, that Germany puts uh, compared to other countries, relatively uh, large amounts of money into this field, but if we compare it to what we what other things cost, it's it's not so much, and that's why I don't think we can expect um, when things horribly go wrong that the work we do to prevent that, you know. But I still think that means that we we still need to continue doing what we're doing. I, I pose the question partly as a devil's advocate. I think most of us who did that work had the sense that we had planted seeds that might not bloom for a very long time, but that, that nevertheless they would lie there dormant. And a number of the people we worked with did leave, but when they leave, they are part of a diaspora that also has an effect. So ultimately, but that is also purely anecdotal and very, very hard 
to measure. And it's similar, by the way, with the work that we do at Deutsche Welle. It's very hard for us to measure what impact we have in the overall global conversation, particularly in, in the framework of disinformation and so on. We're not the equivalent of Russia today, and we never will be. Um, but I think there, too, we have the sense that we do have an impact. It's just not always easy to measure. If I can just pick up, I'd like to open soon to the audience, but if I can just pick up on what Ian said in his first, um, in his first statement, you talked about whether anyone's listening, who can we reach? And in the current geopolitical setting, where there is a great deal of polarization and where there are countries like China that are actively out there trying to link their economic outreach with their ECP outreach, how open, and I want to ask this to Awet, hoping that you can give us a sense from the way that Africa looks at us, how open do you think people are in the Global South to hearing messages from Germany? Maybe, my, maybe I can an answer with an anecdote, because of course I won't be able to speak for Africa. Hugely broad yeah. question, I know. But. but I was talking to a journal journalist uh, from uh, Deutsche Welle, and she was saying for her it's a really big thing to work for Deutsche Welle, because as a child, her father always used to hear, to listen to Deutsche Welle. And Germany was, you know, a big thing, because they've been listening to it. So, um, and now she, she, she's working for Deutsche Welle. So it, shows, it showed me how it has such a big impact. And uh, also, you, you need to know, in a lot of countries, you don't have free media. Like, for example, in the country where I'm born, um, you are dependent on these medias to get the information. And at least from my country, I do know people are dependent on these informations. And I believe if Russia today can reach people, and we see they're reaching people with their information, I'm sure the other side, like Deutsche Welle and other media, can also reach. And if, if we don't work on it, then we're leaving the field to them, and that's really dangerous. That's also a funding issue, by the way, but I won't go there. <laughs> Ian, do you have any further thoughts before we open to the audience in regard to some of the strategic points that Helmut made uh, at, the, at the close of the study. One of them is um, essentially getting everybody out of the silos and doing a comprehensive review of ECP with all relevant actors. How feasible is that from a political economy point of view? Hard. <laughs> But allow me to make two points, because I, I conflate the two recommendations and goals and strategies. Well, yes, everybody thinks you should have a strategy. The trouble is defining a strategy. But in, what, in doing more of what, what works well, to me, a strategic question would be to look at the changing landscape. What's, what's the demand for cultural interventions as an instrument of foreign policy? And what are rivals up to? Because if you don't analyze sufficiently what the rivals are up to, it's very hard to define a strategy that's going to make you better equipped to deal with it. And one question I wrote down here, you can see I've uh, prepared my notes, it was, who are the essential stakeholders in Germany? Obviously, one is the Auswärtigesamt, but is it today's government or the next government? Is it the political parties? Is it uh, BMW and Deutsche Bank? Or is it a combination of all of those? And who's, who's, who is the weight in, in this system? That's something I think it's, quite, it's going to be quite hard to identify if you're going to, to deal with this. Helmut, do you want to respond to that? Or? I think I'd rather hear from the audience. Good. So, then let's I, open. I could respond to it, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Then let's open to the audience. Who would like to pose a question or share a comment? I see one back here. Are we going to take a mic around? Yeah, thanks. Let's take three, and then we'll get some responses. Hi. Is it, you hear me? Yeah, it's on. Hi. Uh, Dimitro from the best school in the world, master's student here. Uh, I see that you uh, didn't include sport diplomacy as a, um, a part because of its non-applicability to some of the countries uh, examined in the report. 
Nonetheless, for those that do include sport, diplomacy is a central part of their ECPs. How would you tangibly evaluate the effectiveness of sport as soft power? Great. That's a wonderful question. Thank you. We'll come back to answers in just a moment. Who else would like to pose a question? Hi, I'm Uli Schwatter. I'm a sociologist uh, who worked a lot on science diplomacy for the background. Um, I cannot but fully agree to the demand to prioritize and have a more strategic review and relaunch of um, um, external cultural policies. Yet, I think it's a little too short to just focus on the challenges of raising, rising, hard powers, as we could have seen two years ago, since two years ago. Rather, I think another very severe challenge to the current ECP is the rising cultural cleavages, the cultural wars you can see everywhere in the world, in the US as well as in this country with the rising far right all over Europe, with the cultural wars in India going on, and not the least in Israel with the rising demographic force of the Mitzrayim, we see a complete different country that also fuels a number of new aggressive outreaches to the, to the uh, surrounding territories, etc. So how do we account for these, or how do we address, cope with these cultural cleavages that are not just new cleavages, but are fought out very aggressively and inc um, increasingly aggressive? And another short comment uh, on German ECP. Uh, in my view, it's, it's been very idiosyncratic in that there are so many different institutions. And unlike in Britain, it's not the common denominator of what the economic impact might be. It's rather sort of tit for tats here and there. And a number of institutions that all do their little niche here and there with but little coordination. And it's also, at least uh, I could see it from the science or educational side, um, these institutions are very, very sort of um, hard-nosed and, and very autonomous in their claims and would not tolerate to have any kind of coordinative power mm -hmm. so far. So this is a problem, I think. Thank you very much. Peter, I'm going to come back to you if that's okay. I had one more over here that I'd like to take now. Um, Hi, thanks so much for coming and speaking. I'm from the United States on a Fulbright scholarship, which you could argue is an element of very formal American cultural policy. And I had a question about Israel-Palestine, because we didn't really mention it in the talk. Um, you know, the, the Bundestag has had a resolution supporting Israel, and there have been very formal speeches by the Chancellor and Minister Habeck, and there's been an overall shift in the culture of discourse in German universities and in the public sphere. And I'm wondering if the environment and the very remarkably strong pro-Israel sentiment that's been shared by the German government that I think stands above many of Germany's peers in Europe. Do I, what my question is, what do you think, if at all, that this discourse that is coming from Germany, how that will influence Germany's perception in the global south and how that might influence um, international cultural policy moving forward? Thank you. Those are three very meaty questions. Is it all right for you if I come to you after we get a quick response round here? Good. Um, who would like to speak to any of those points? Sports diplomacy, science diplomacy, uh, then the, the question of the different actors. We did briefly address that already. But, um, and then finally, um, perceptions in the global south. Try start? Go ahead. I wonder if you had in mind Saudi Arabia with its so-called sport washing. Yes, it's working for them, but it's also raising a, a strange kind of red flag because the rest of the world is looking at it and saying, look, this is Saudi Arabia trying to uh, cleanse itself by inviting boxing matches and football and all sorts of other things. To, so it, it's almost a, having a perverse effect in, in positioning Saudi Arabia and the rest of the world. Now, part of your question I'm going to answer in relation to the UK, I think the report is a bit remiss in portraying the UK purely as a, a branding economic exercise, because if you think about the Commonwealth, that is a 
It's post-colonial, but it's also a post-colonial entity which has attracted new members. Who, they're never part of the British Empire in the first place. So it's a, an odd phenomenon which is very much treasured in the British sense of self-power. Whether it works is a different question, but uh, it's something that might be worth considering when you're talking about the, the partnerships that are, are created outside the, the economic sphere. Other thoughts on what we just heard? I would? Yeah. Maybe the question um, on the Bundestag and the re resolution, as you said. Um, I think, here yeah, we have a clear uh, position when it comes to um, Israel out of our responsibility, and that's what I meant when I said the communication with the Arab world is uh, not easy at the moment. Uh, and we need more communication. And uh, we do have also clear uh, position on the need of humanitarian aid, on the situation in, in, um, in Gaza, for instance. Uh, but I think that's not really heard because we show our responsibility and our also solidarity with Israel very clearly, which is which is uh, important, but we also say we can't just leave the situation in Gaza like it is right now. We need help. We need to support people there. We need to have a different solution than the situation right now. That's uh, what Louise Armsbeck said. That's what uh, Annalena, uh, Annalena Baerbock said. So we need communication on this, that we are working on peace, that we are working for a better situation. But I think that's not really heard that much. So that's why we need these uh, communication channels to find uh, a better way to work with each other. And I really do believe um, also as a black person, and I see like in the black community also, there's a lot of critics. I do believe that the only way to peace is really communication and talking with each other. And we really have to work on that. So that's what, what we are focusing on, and I hope we will find a way. And I know it's a little bit hard at the moment. Any other comments from the panel before we go to more questions? I think on, 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 on sports diplomacy, um, and, uh, of course, there's this uh, relatively new phenomenon, right, of sport washing. Uh, but, um, uh, there is a significant commercial side to sport. I think about the uh, success of the Premiership, right? and that, is, um, that reflects also, the, I think, the attractiveness of the, of the United Kingdom. And, uh, but what, uh, what we had in mind, and, and that's why we didn't include it, actually, is uh, the um, sports diplomacy in the way that um, uh, the US and China approached each other in the, I think it was in, in the 1970s, was called ping pong diplomacy, that through sports you can open up uh, channels. Now, um, uh, only on your uh, comment, uh, I think it resonates really with uh, what Ian is saying. Uh, I think what we need to do, or what would be needed, and I speak as a researcher here, we, we need a very a good stakeholder mapping uh, in this change geopolitics. Uh, uh, you know what? Not, not only the, the major institutions like the AD and the Goethe Institute, but but also what corporate interests uh, are involved. If let's say Germany decides that that particular region of the world is of strategic importance because right, and who then uh, enters the radar screen, and are there synergies, right? Are we at cross purposes, and, and that maybe that's the way forward to get the redundancies out of the system as well. I would like to add something. I thought that you, um, your words were chosen very well on how um, uh, the uh, situation has, has now shifted. And I think that, yes, Germany might be regarded differently in certain parts of the world, but I think, you know, coming back to your very first questions, what are the biggest changes that we see? I think we're also seeing a shift in how German society um, is thinking about global challenges. Because I think now it becomes so clear that what we're thinking here and that we, what we are doing here has uh, implications on a global scale and vice versa. And I think to, to our work, this is... I mean, now it's tough yeah, because communication isn't easy. We're in discussions, um, it's becoming emotional. But in the end, I think we need to have this global approach and that we, we need to be aware of in Germany that um, 
everything that we do is linked and that people in other countries are affected by our policy decisions, but about our discourses. And I, th I think this might be something which is hitting Germany a little bit like a, like a shock. And, th and this is why it's so tense now and everyone is sort of participating also in the conversation. So I think the, a major shift is also happening insi inside of Germany. And, um, and we'll see where it goes and hopefully if, if our work, you know, um, uh, remains um, important in, in this, uh, in, uh, yeah, in, in the pol policy and budget uh, decisions, then we can all work towards um, creating these, these spaces of trust and understanding. Thank you. Very, very short, if you would. Yeah. May I add just a simple thing? Um, just, I was thinking about it, and I think what also would help is maybe being less Eurocentristic, you know? Being in the shoes of the others, because now we talk about Russia and Ukraine and Hamas and Israel, but that's not, maybe, you know, for other countries, like uh, for Costa Rica, maybe uh, Nicaragua is much more important. So we go with our views, with our lenses, and to these countries, so this have maybe also to change, to increase the possibilities to have a communication and look at things maybe from another perspective. Thank you. So I had a comment from Peter Kettner, and then a couple more questions, I believe. Does someone have the microphone? No worries. Thank you. Um, Is it on? Could we make sure that one's on? Yeah, no, it works. Um, yeah, three comments. Um, first thing. When I talked in the beginning, um, I didn't say it's enough money. I just said it's a lot of money. And I stick to that point. One billion euros is a lot of money. And if we spend one billion euros in taxpayers' money, um, we have to say what we're doing with it. And something has to come out of it. Um, otherwise, we could spend it for other things. That, that was my point. And, and, and uh, I think it's utterly important to, to make that clear um, that, um, that this is not well, we, we're not somewhere in, a, in, a, in an outer space area or so. The second point is um, when it comes to measure, measuring of results, this is, an important, this is really important, and it gets more and more important because right now we're in a, in a time where the ones we're concurring with for budgets, for instance, um, have very very clear, um, not only very clear objectives, but very can, can offer very clear results. If you buy tanks, everybody knows what is going to happen and, and how, they, how, how they can be used. Um, in the case of, 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 of cultural diplomacy, what we say is, or what we can say is that if our instruments works, uh, work and if our tools work, um, in the best case, that means that nothing happens. Um, because there's a bit more stability, there is more exchange, there is more, um, more peace, um, and that is hard to sell. Um, and my third point, and, and that is something that is really something f that comes from my heart, uh, sports diplomacy is really, really, I think, m maybe one of the most important points we have in cultural diplomacy, especially when it comes to Germany. Um, I mean, we've seen what happened, what happened after 2006 and the, and the Sommermärchen. Uh, we have seen what happened after 2014, that the picture of Germany had changed dramatically uh, when you saw that World Cup winner team um, that didn't look like Germans used to look 20 years ago uh, or 20 years before. Um, and we have a number of projects we did during the past six decades in the field of sports diplomacy where it was about going to other countries and, um, and, 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 and just um, working together in the field of coach, um, uh, yeah, of, of, of helping coaches, help, helping people, um, and bringing together people just making sports. And I think it's one of the most effective tools we have. Um, it's much cheaper than others. It's, um, it, it reaches it out. It's much cheaper than other means, and it's definitely reaching out to, to all parts of societies. If you take a ball and throw it into children, they will start to play. And, and that is really something, um, yes, we should do more in that. 
in that respect. I found myself thinking that German sports is kind of like Hollywood and films. Um, it, well, definitely. It's, it's just, you know, <laughs> it, be, yeah, it's that aura thing. <laughs> well, but think about the women's teams, handball. There's lots of German sports that are out there gaining admiration in the world. So, but I won't editorialize. Um, who in the audience has a super short question because we're just about out of time? Um, you're in the front row. I had somebody there in the middle somewhere. Yeah, go ahead, please. Hello. As a Brazilian, it's quite hard to talk about the 2014 memories, but <laughs> let's go. <laughs> well, um, I think an interesting thing for me was to perceive that naturally no, the, the, the international cultural relations or cultural diplomacy need to respond to the current challenges and my question is about the intersections that culture no, can have with other global challenges and if you have perceived and realized the connection between culture for instance with climate related issues or other social issues how how do you perceive that how much have you perceived that and also if you think uh, there is going to be more and more instrumentalization of culture to be connected with these other areas, right? So we won't see culture for the purpose of culture anymore. We will be seeing more culture for the purpose of something else. Thank you very much. And we'll take one more. So here I have one in the front row. Sorry, it's hard to see the hands in the back. Okay, we'll take two more. Very short here and then here in the middle. Right. Um, thank you very much for the panel today. It's been very insightful. Um, my question is, uh, well, one and a half years ago, we decided to break off a lot of uh, projects with Russia after it attacked Ukraine. And obviously, there is a lot of good reasons for that. But we've also talked about safe spaces. And when I listen to a lot of my friends and acquaintances that are in the area of Russia studies, um, you hear a lot about there being a gap now um, and also a vacuum that is taken up by other actors. Um, is there something we can do to remedy that or, yeah, what's underway? What's your assessment of that? Thank, Thank you. you. Great question. Here in the middle. Hi, thanks for the panel. Uh, my name is Sofia. I'm also Brazilian and that actually ties into my question a little bit because the panel spoke a lot about um, interior cultural policy and exterior cultural policy and how do we support these countries in which perhaps um, interior culture is not as consumed for example in brazil perhaps um, the population doesn't watch as many brazilian films as they do american films how can european countries and um, support this um, you know this reception and this uh, to this reception to um, the culture of other countries and how can we strengthen that in a way? Thank you. Who would like to speak to which points? I'll essentially just go down the panel, speak to whatever you consider to be important and briefly if you would, because we're now getting into overtime. Um, so Ian, would you like to get us started? Okay, I'll try to answer that last point because there's certainly been an attempt at European level to project itself as normative power Europe, uh, to give the title of one particular academic article. That normative power Europe is in decline. I think it, it, there's a recognition that it's not really working. It's partly to do, and this coincides now with what's happening in Germany, with economic difficulties. The economic difficulties that Germany is going through for a country that used to be seen as the powerhouse of Europe is a complication in any kind of attempt to project power. Second short point, I would say in general, beware a kind of Ponglossian approach where all these uh, approaches to cultural diplomacy are going to have wonderful results. Uh, remember what uh, Voltaire said about, uh, about that. Uh, there's also in this context, very short point. We should cultivate the garden. Could do, yeah. But our, our own dear Boris used to like the idea of having his cake and eating it. He's been exposed as being wrong on that. And I think maybe if I can try to invent a German word, 
How about this? I know it's a good, it's a good tradition in Germany. Instead of Seitenwinder, you need a new Kuchen Essen vendor. <laughs> Yeah, maybe uh, on the question um, like interactions between culture and other topics, climate uh, crisis and so on. Uh, I think culture is always working on different topics. You know, like um, for instance, we have, I know a lot of projects here in Berlin who are also working with other countries. For instance, the HKW um, having cultural projects where they are researching on indigenous knowledge on how to save the planet, how to cultivate food and work. And these are cultural projects in cooperation with other countries. So I do feel, and culture was always not only for itself, it's also that way, but it's also in a lot of sense political and interaction with society and other topics. So I do feel that is possible and uh, I feel it's a good thing because it's a, uh, on, on many uh, perspectives, I feel like culture can transport information in a much better way than, for, for instance, I as a politician could ever do. And also um, growing awareness on these topics. You can do it through culture much more than when I would speak in parliament. So there is this interaction and uh, I think it's a good thing, and I think it should also continue. Maybe on the question of Russia, I think that's an important question. And um, not all programs have been suspended. And I think uh, one of the core beliefs of cultural relations of what we do is that we need to, uh, that, that points of contact need to remain open with civil society and with those actors who we share values with. And this is continuing, and it is also continuing outside of Russia. Um, and um, the other question about Brazil, I thought that was also super interesting because if I understand correctly, then um, there you, you express a wish for cultural policy in Brazil to develop in a certain way and how, the, how Europe can sort of um, chime in. Um, when I was working in Brussels, um, one of the core uh, ideas of the network of the EU National Institutes for Culture was to bring more coordination uh, to EU member states in their um, ECP, in their external po uh, cultural policy, which I th is something that we didn't discuss today, but which I think is also uh, needed, yeah? um, because pooling of resources, especially in, in times when, when, um, when things are tough, um, is something that creates more impact, more credibility. I think it's also one of the strengths of the, of the German uh, way of doing things is to have this arm's length approach, which, which gives credibility, but you know, to, with, with uh, European institutes of culture or with the EU member states, to actually do round table discussion on, on, um, yeah, on domestic cultural policy, for instance. I, I think there's also tandems, not necessarily with, um, with the Americas, but I think I've seen it in Northern Africa and France maybe, I'm not sure, to sort of tandem up on how to develop internal um, cultural policies in countries where there's little of that. So yeah, that's, I think that's, that could be a potential way of uh, answering your question. Thank you very much for mentioning the European uh, aspect. I had that uh, in here, but uh, we ran out of time, but indeed a very important topic. Uh, Helmut. Last word. Yeah, I think on the European uh, aspect, um, I, I strongly believe that um, uh, Europe or the EU could do much, much more when it comes to culture. Right? Uh, I think the EU should actually have its own external cultural policy department or whatever you might call it. And uh, I think it's high time uh, for that. Um, there's also this talk you hear a lot, and I think it was mentioned this evening, right? That, um, uh, Europe stars is descending and uh, Europe isn't what it used to be and, and so on. Well, there was an interesting op-ed piece by, by, by Timothy Garden Ash the other day and he said that Europe's biggest problem is not that it's less relevant, that it's simply too attractive. Right? Why do all the people want to come to Europe? Have you ever thought about that? Right? Uh, that's what he said, right? And so that you can look at it uh, two ways. Um, and uh, on your, your point, um, Instrumentalization uh, is a difficult term, 
right? Because it often suggests that uh, you're being co-opted, right? And that your your goals are somehow subordinated or incorporated into somebody else's agenda. And you can only avoid that if you have a, a certain self-confidence about what it is. And I think uh, maybe we have to draw red lines about what uh, we do and what we don't do when it comes to external cultural policy. I think working more in the environmental field is probably a good idea, but there are other areas where you might want to be more, more hesitant. The other danger is that it's going to be ignored. Right, which very often happened that culture is the first thing to go. Right. Anyway. <coughs> Thank you very much. I'm afraid we'll have to leave it there, but that is the, only the end of the formal discussions. We all are now invited, thanks to our hosts and organizers, to continue the conversation in an informal setting uh, at the reception. So let us first give our panel a very, very warm round of applause, if you would. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for this wide-ranging and truly thought-provoking uh, discussion. Also to Peter Kettner, many thanks for your introductory remarks. They also gave us a great deal to think about. And we're very grateful to all of you for being with us, for your attention and your contributions, uh, dear guests. So I wish you a wonderful evening and uh, hope that our paths cross again. Goodbye. <laughs>